Hello everyone, I'm Ying Chen. Hi, and my name is Ricardo, and today we will tell you about a new class of side channel attacks called Hertzbleed. Let's start by looking at two classes of attacks that we have known for 25 years, power side channel attacks and remote timing attacks. These two disjoint classes of attacks are very different. On the one hand, we have power side channel attacks. These attacks allow to infer very small changes in a program's execution, but they require access to some special measurement interfaces. On the other hand, we have remote timing attacks. These attacks only allow to infer coarse-grained changes in a program's execution. However, they do not require access to any special measurement interface. Hertz bleed bridges the gap between these two disjoint classes of attacks by turning power side channel attacks into remote timing attacks. Hertz bleed makes information that was originally only available to power side channel attacks now available through remote timing. And as we will see, Hertz bleed is a real threat to security, and it can be used to mount timing attacks even on cryptographic implementations that were considered secure against timing attacks up until today. The mechanism that enables Hertz bleed is frequency scaling, also known as DVFS. And in this presentation, we will first tell you about how and why DVFS leaks on modern processors. We will then look at how to mount remote timing attacks using DVFS as a leakage channel. And third, we will discuss why Hertz bleed is fundamentally different from all existing timing attacks and requires to rethink the definition of constant time programming. Let's start by looking at DVFS on a modern Intel processor. When we run a workload on a modern Intel processor, this is what the frequency trace looks like. As you can see, the frequency of the processor starts at around 4.5 gigahertz. This is what we call the max turbo state, and it can last for about eight seconds. After eight seconds, however, the processor hits a certain thermal limit, and the frequency has to scale down to 3.9 to 4 gigahertz. The second part of the plot shows this second state, which is called steady state. And this will last until the duration, until the workload completes. Our analysis focuses on this second part, which is steady state. And in particular, our key observation is that steady state frequency depends on power consumption. For example, here are two workloads that normally consume different amounts of power. Our key observation is that these two workloads will also run at different steady state frequency. The higher the power consumption, the lower the steady state frequency. From now on, we will refer to steady state frequency just as frequency. So one thing we know from power side channels, since we studied them for 25 years, is that they leak information that is about very small changes in a program's execution. And power side channels are even known to be data dependent. So we can ask the question, is Frequency, also data dependent. And to answer this question, we run a new experiment where we run a constant time workload. This workload has a fixed set of constant time instructions, and we only change the data that these instructions are processing, which is the input. Now, we know from prior work that when we change the data that is computed on by instructions, we can have different power consumptions. However, the key observation is that these differences in power consumption also show as differences in frequency. And once again, the higher the power consumption, the lower the frequency. As we will see, this is a very important observation because it will allow us to mount timing attacks even on cryptographic implementations that follow constant time programming principles. Let's look at an even more concrete example. Suppose we have this function that computes the sum of two arguments, first and second. And suppose that we call this function with two different sets of inputs, test one and test two. We can ask the question, which ones of these two tests will cause the function and the processor to run at a higher frequency? And we can think about this question for a second. The answer is test two. But why is it the case that test two runs at a higher frequency? To answer this question in our paper, we constructed a leakage model which describes the dependency between data, CPU power consumption, and CPU frequency on modern Intel processors. And we found that there are three independent effects that affect this dependency. 
And now we will explain briefly each of these three effects. Let's start from the humming distance effect. Suppose that during the workload's execution, we have a computation that updates the content of a register, as shown in the slide. This might be, for example, a shift left instruction. When this computation occurs, there are, in this case, 10 bit flips, from 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1, which means that the humming distance is 10. In this other example, however, there are only 6 bit flips, which means that the humming distance is 6. And what we found is that the lower the humming distance, the lower the power consumption, and the higher the frequency. The second effect that is independent from this transistor switching humming distance effect is the humming weight effect. Suppose that, again, during the workload's execution, we have a computation that looks like this. In this case, there are no bit flips, so the humming distance is zero. However, we found that the number of ones that are set within each data word also affects power consumption and frequency. So in this example, the humming weight is 12. But in this other example, the humming weight is 8. So what we found is that uh, the lower the humming weight, once again, the lower the power consumption and the higher the frequency. And as we will see, just these two effects, which are the humming distance and the humming weight, will have particularly bad effects on cryptographic implementations that compute on low or high humming weight or humming distance data, depending on secrets. But the third and last effect that we discovered is the one of bit positions. This might perhaps be the most surprising. What we found is that even if we run computations that have the same humming distance and the same humming weight, such as the ones shown in the slide, the positions of one within the registers also affects power consumption and CPU frequency. So in this specific case, the second computation runs at a higher frequency. And we encourage you to check the paper to figure out more information about this behavior. But really, the important observation here is that going forward, we need to take into account the bit positions as well, not just humming weights and humming distances. Now, we have seen these, um, these effects now as independent, but in the paper, we also show that these effects are additive. And we are now going to move on to show you how to exploit all these behaviors to mount remote timing attacks on cryptographic implementations. Thank you. So in the first part of the talk, we say that CPU frequency depends on data being computed on. Why is it even possible to mount this via remote timing? The reason is very simple because frequency and time are actually equivalent. For a constant cycle program, for inside this case, four, the higher the frequency, the shorter the running time. The amount of cycle is always fixed, but when running on modern Intel CPU with frequency scaling, it might not be real constant time. Inside the second part of the talk, we show how to use her speed to mount remote time attack a post-quantum key encapsulation scheme called Psyche, super singular isogeny key encapsulation, by turning a power side channel into a timing analysis. Psyche uses public key encryption scheme to secure a shared key. We focus this on the decapsulation algorithm that takes in the secret key as well as the ciphertext and outputs the shared key K. One thing to note here is that this C can be anything. It can come from an honest user or a malicious attacker. Psyche is a widely studied post-quantum key encapsulation scheme. It has production-ready implementation from Cloudflare and Microsoft. It, it was deployed by Amazon as a hybrid encryption, encryption scheme, and it is in the round four of this post-quantum crypto competition. Now I'm going to give you a very high-level overview of our attack. Inside our attack, we found a vulnerability in Psyche that is brand new, which means a attacker can construct a malicious ciphertext C prime and send it to the decapsulation algorithm of Psyche and creates a large number of computations on zero depending on a single secret key bit. For example, if the first bit equal to zero, the partial transcript of the internal algorithm state will output something look almost random. Otherwise, the partial transcript will output almost all zero. From a very high level, you can understand the decapsulation algorithm 
as a loop of a equals to a times ri. When the first bit equals to zero, all the ris come from a ran random distribution. In the other case, somehow a zero jumps in, and once it is here, it is never going to go away. And therefore, it creates a domino effect on zero. Obviously, when first bit equals to zero, the CPU is going to consume more power, runs fast, runs slower, and because of her split, and the decapsulation algorithm takes longer amount of time. This is how we extract the secret key bit by bit, because such a behavior generalized to every single bit. Now let's dig deeper into this decapsulation algorithm. We focus on the very first function called by this algorithm, called three-point ladder. The input to this function is a secret key m as well as the ciphertext, consists of xp, xq, and xq minus p. This algorithm loops the secret key bit by bit, and in every loop iteration, it, it has a data flow depending on the current secret key bit mi as well as the ciphertext. Now let's loop, take a look even deeper into this x double add function. There's a vulnerability inside this x double and add function, and by exploiting which, we can develop an adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. Which means, if we know the secret key up to bit k minus 1, the attacker can come up with a ciphertext c prime, such that if the next unknown bit, mk, does not equal to mk minus 1, it can put a special point t of order 2 into this function and trigger a edge case. Once this edge case is triggered, it creates a domino effect on zero. However, in the other case, such a point t will only be put this into this function as the second input, and this does not trigger the edge case, so there will be no domino effects on zero. And by exploiting such a behavior, we can extract the secret key bit by bit. For example, if i mi does not equal to i minus 1, there's a domino effect on 0, so that the data flow has low Hamming weight, Hamming distance, and the CPU runs faster, so it takes a shorter amount of time compared to the other case. We target two state of art implementation from Cloudflare and Microsoft, inside which we launch a remote timing attack with the client sending a malicious ciphertext C prime and the server decapsulates C prime and sends back an acknowledgement. The malicious client will only time how long it takes to finish unconcurrent requests. We are able to recover the full secret key in Circle in 36 hours and full secret key in Pico Crypto in 89 hours. Such a faulty behavioral attack is allowed by its own threat model, and it will not be amount to remote timing attack by any prior side channels, because Although there are a lot of computations on zeros, the program itself is always constant cycle. However, since Hertzby can turn low Hamming weight, Hamming distance data flow into lower running time, that's how we can mount this by remote timing. Um, although Psyc is already broken last week, exploiting Psyc is only an example of, of showing the power of Hertzby. Now let's think about the motivate the security implication of her split beyond psych. Timing attack has been here for 25 years. During these 25 years, we developed what is called constant time programming. However, her split shows that the current practices for how to write constant time programming code are no longer sufficient to achieve real constant time execution because her split can turn power leakage into timing leakage. Here's another way to think about it. There are three factors influences the runtime of a certain program, instructions per program, cycles per instruction, and seconds per cycle. Note, the third one is also the inverse of frequency. All the previous timing attacks focus on to exploiting the first two factors. That's why the current constant time programming principles take care of the first two factors. First, we exploit the third one. First, we motivate, motivate us to rethink how to write constant time programming code to achieve real constant time programming. With that, we would like to conclude our talk, and we can take in more questions, and we have more information on our website. Thank you very much.